And tonight, Hillary Clinton finally meets the press. Kind of. What she said and what she didn't say coming right up. ICE is still gaining ground in Iraq. Can anything slow them down? A Supreme Court justice officiates a gay wedding and cites the Constitution in the process. And ABC's George Stephanopoulos continues to come under fire for his connection with the Clintons. We'll talk about all of that. Plus, yay or nay, potluck, all that stuff. This is The Daily Wrap, live from New York City. And tonight on The Wrap, my co-host and serious XM radio host, Rick Gunk. Welcome. That would be me. Yeah. And to his right, <laughs> Philadelphia attorney and America's pundit, she is Heather Hansen. And finally, author, spiritual leader, and editor of The Wisdom Daily, Brad Hirschfield is back once again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, very busy night. Let's get right to the Daily Download. Well, Andrea, she answered about five minutes worth of questions. She did address the emails. Yes, it's been so long since Hillary Clinton last answered any questions from reporters that it's now breaking news when she does. In fact, the Washington Post had to reset its Clinton questions clock. Prior to that, Mrs. Clinton had gone nearly a month, or over 40,000 minutes, according to said Washington Post, since last answering a question from the press. And today, she finally talked about the growing email controversy surrounding her time as Secretary of State, specifically her relationship with friend and former Clinton Foundation employee, Sidney Blumenthal, who has sent sensitive intelligence reports to the former Secretary of State, excuse me, uh, while she was at the State Department. Could you, Clinton, Clinton, could you explain your relationship as Secretary of State with uh, Sidney Blumenthal? There was a report out this morning that you've exchanged several emails. And should Americans expect that if elected president, you would have that same type of relationship with these old friends that you've had for so long? <laughs> I have many, many old friends. And uh, I always think that uh, uh, it's important when you get into politics to have friends you had before you were in politics and to understand uh, what's on their minds. And he's been a friend of mine for a long time. He sent me unsolicited uh, emails, which I uh, passed on in some instances. Uh, key words there, unsolicited emails. By the way, did you notice her eyes when she was responding to that question about Sidney Blumenthal? I, look, we, we do very smart, thoughtful commentary here in the Daily Wrap, but everybody was talking about that on, on social media today. They were not, not small. Anyway, <laughs> Rick, it, it almost felt like the queen had to go meet the peasants and answer some of their stupid questions. That's what it felt well, that like to me. That would be one take if, if we're hell-bent on criticizing her if she does or if she doesn't. Over a month she, or about a month. But she did. Mm -hmm. So why are we criticizing her for finally doing it? I agree, she took too long, but she did it. So wouldn't this be a day that we talk about her answers? By the way, I don't get this whole Sidney Blumenthal thing. I have friends in government, some very high up, and I send them emails too with thoughts and advice. But do you then, do they then forward them to their they colleagues Why and is that say such it's a important terrible to, thing? Because they're not vetted. I mean, what do you mean he, they're not vetted? You're he is sending information from vetted. Libya. That's that's the problem. I mean, did you read the New York Times article? That's yeah, what they're I did. talking about. It's based I on did. faulty information, and she's now handing it on to the people to act upon it no, she, when it's oh, based on wait. faulty first information. Of all, first of all, she didn't hand it on to people to act upon it. She handed it on for opinions, and you know what the opinions were? We don't, but we right, don't buy what he said. So wait, let's tell that part because it's pretty important. Oh. She's only passing along thoughts from somebody she thinks is smart. People do this all the time. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. If, if the press is going to criticize Hillary Clinton in a stupid way, and this was a stupid way, if they had acted on something that he said and it was faulty information, I get it. They didn't act on it because they disagreed. If this is what the press is going to do because they're mad at her because she won't answer questions, then the press is going to have absolutely no influence in this election. I don't think that's what they're doing. Were that, that happening? They're no, they're not. Here's the thing. She has created a culture where everything revolves around her privately. And that's she exactly what people are No, it doesn't matter. She has behaved in a way. We have five minutes of answering questions, 40,000 minutes of not answering questions. Yeah. First, there was one private email address. Now it turns out there are What's two private email Sydney addresses. Blumenthal? We're talking about what that. What it has to do with when you create a culture of privatizing everything and yeah. lack public accountability, you're feeding the troll. That's fine. I get so it. So what you I'm have telling to you is, is, if the troll is going to make silly criticisms. No, no. 
they, this has co-arisen. She has contempt mm -hmm. for the press and transparency, and, and yet, the people whose identity is to be transparent are overreacting. And yet she's so going if to you be want to say she's overreacting, of the she's not overreacting. So? The press is overreacting. I think if you want to say the press is overreacting, understand. They, she has created the culture of I'm overreaction. I'm not saying that they can't do 100%. it. 100%. I didn't say they can't do it. What I'm saying is they will find themselves with very little influence after a very short period of time mm -hmm. if they continue to, to make criticisms that the public looks at and goes, what are you talking about? Well, you, you just declared that she'll be the next president Actually, of the United she States. Will be. You, you think, based on the way that she's conducted herself, since the book tour and all the way through, let me finish the question, please. The way she's conducting herself as a candidate or on the book tour last year, that she has looked competent, confident, when she's been out on the campaign trail, her handlers have hit her from the press. She answered those questions today, not because she wanted to, but because she was forced to. How can she go for the next 500 days through the campaign and act well, you're assuming in that the she way will. she is. And you know, I've been critical about the way her first couple weeks went. I think it got a lot better. Mm -hmm. But I gotta tell you something, with all of those things that have happened, the emails, all this stuff, it's all come down to that issue we always see in the, uh, in the, in the, the, the whatchamacallit, the surveys, uh, is she trustworthy? And nobody thinks she's trustworthy. And guess they what? Care. They don't care yeah. because they think that she'll put more you money what, in there. You know what pocket. poll I wanna see, and then we gotta move on. I wanna see likability numbers. It doesn't matter. They'll still... That they'll doesn't still matter? No, I think they it like doesn't. Her. Snoop Dogg was on TV this week, and he mm -hmm. said he's going to vote for her. I yeah, think that... I think well, that's a ringing recommendation. <laughs> that's what he thinks Game of Thrones is medieval history. Anyway, <laughs> we have to move on. <laughs> Mrs. Clinton's call for the quick release of her emails came after a federal judge rejected a plan by the State Department. The department had planned to release portions of the 55,000 pages of emails turned over by Clinton by January of next year. But the judge says it must come sooner than that and that they should be released in batches after being vetted by the State Department. Why did the judge step in here, Ms. Hansen? You know, any time that you've, you're trying to get something from somebody and it's taking a very long time, the judges will step in and say, you know what, I'm going to help you to do this a little bit more quickly. If you look at it, there's a project manager, two case analysis, and nine Freedom of Information Act reviewers looking at this information. The right. fact that it's going to take them this long on the taxpayer's money is a little worrisome. He's trying to move up along the process. Okay. Well, prior to Hillary Clinton taking questions today, Bill Clinton has been doing most of the talking for the Clinton campaign. Recently on David Letterman, the 42nd president joked about a possible return to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. If she wins the election, the chances are 100 percent I'll move back. <laughs> if, if, wait, wait. If I'm asked. So will the former first lady be able to separate from the circus sideshow? That is Bill Clinton, Brad Hurstfield. I think the question is, is she able to separate herself from the circus sideshow she's creating with her own candidacy? That's the real question. I mean, the, the stuff with them as a couple is what it is, and it's a little bit ridiculous, and he keeps saying silly things like, you know, I got to get by on $25 million a year. But I think the bigger question does come back. Can she stop creating a sideshow of her own campaign? She said today that she wanted to, all the emails to, to get out. These are the same emails that she has concealed from the public in a server in her basement that she has since destroyed for years. I, I know you're shaking no, your head. No, it's, 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 it's fault analysis. Of course she is wants it faulty? them out. Did she, did yes, she destroy the server? Did she conceal it from yeah, the public? Wait, 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 wait. So wait. why is that faulty exactly? Because she didn't conceal them from the public. The public wouldn't have seen them if they were sitting in a State Department server. She concealed and, the, and the fact what, that she had her own wait, wait, server, wait. Rick. Let, let me finish. Let me finish, please. And what you don't understand is had those emails come out when they were originally planned in January, what does that date mean? two weeks before the Iowa primary, you bet she wants them out as soon as possible. She wants them out yesterday. And by the way, there's nothing bad in those emails because she already went through them. Well, that's oh, right. Well, she got rid she of went through right. them. Well, you know there's right. nothing bad she in the email? Well, well would you would nice you stuff. turn in, if we know that she destroyed it, would you send them in the stuff that's going to hurt you? It's 55,000 emails. Yeah, but she went, but they went through them. But I mean, that's why you're criticizing them. There are 73 them. other Freedom of Information Act cases pending and with regard to this stuff. There's going to be more information probably from the aides, because I think you're right. I think if she's destroying email, she's probably destroying the yeah. worst of them. But there is so much more to come. Sure, she's going to say she wants it all to come out, and she probably way, isn't so worried about hers. If you guys would like to bet against Bill Clinton politically, just I'll take the bet. Name the price. No, the, old Bill Clinton, Bill. the old Bill Clinton, I agree with you. Yeah, this he, Bill Clinton is not mistakes. the same He will one. be. He will be. Right? When it's showtime, he will be. Okay. I'll take all comers <laughs> on all right. that. 
Rick is now our bookie. Out there. <laughs> Coming up next, ISIS continues to gain ground in Iraq. We'll talk about that. Stick right there. When a major city in Iraq, Ramadi, it gets overrun uh, by ISIL, and the administration says, well, it's just a temporary setback. It's 70 miles from Baghdad. It's time to, for the president to get serious about this threat uh, to uh, Americans and our allies all around the world. And that was House Speaker John Boehner today sharply criticizing President Obama's ISIS strategy, adding that, quote, hope is not a strategy. Boehner is calling for the president to withdraw his military authorization request and present one that Boehner says represents a clear, overarching strategy to defeat the terrorist threat. Joining us now, Jim Hansen. He is the executive vice president of the Center for Security Policy. Mr. Hansen also served in the U.S. Army Special Forces and conducted counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and other operations. Jim, thanks for joining us from Arlington. We appreciate it. Pleasure to be with you. So, simple question, are we losing the war with ISIS right now? Yes. I mean, that's pretty simple. There's no question we're losing. Um, I, I think it's almost comical to watch the Department of Defense now turn into Baghdad Bob, if you remember the, the spokesman for Saddam's regime, talking about how the loss of Ramadi, the provincial capital of Anbar province, 60 miles from Baghdad, it's no big deal. Don't worry about that. Um, it, it's sad, and I don't think they need to change a strategy. I think they need a strategy, period. So, Jim, it's Rick Unger. So, you know what? You, you listen to what the speaker said. He does what so many people do, which is to criticize, right? Can you give us, in a very clear and probably oversimplified answer, what would you do differently over there to deal with this? I would arm the Sunni tribes where ISIS is operating. They're the same tribes that joined with us in the Anbar Awakening to defeat the precursor to ISIS, which was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. We surged troops in. We made deals with those Sunni tribal leaders who aren't big fans of ISIS and weren't fans of Al-Qaeda. And they helped us defeat those guys. They could do it again. Jim, Heather Hansen here. If you looked at the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, you saw an article about ISIS in Iraq, and then you saw an article about ISIS in Libya. My concern is that as soon as we get rid of them in one place, they're going to, I think the article said, you, it's like a balloon. You squeeze, and they just move to another place. How do you stop that from happening? Well, you can't. Uh, what you can do is take the place where they planted the black flag, flag of jihad and called it a caliphate and shut that down. We deposed Saddam in Iraq and then left, creating the vacuum that ISIS and now the Iranians are filling. We need to take them down, pull that black flag down, and then the lesser places where they are are not nearly as big a problem. And Jim, final question, and I saw this picture and, and I've been talking about it with my colleagues all day because it just astounds me. And I, I don't have any military background like you do or anything close to it, but I see a parade, a convoy of ISIS pickup trucks that looks like it goes yeah. two miles long on an open road in pretty much what looks like an open desert. And I have to know why we, we could see it. We clearly can see it. It looks like a clear day that, and I'm not talking so much in the city because there may be civilians around, but shots like that how do we not see that and how do we not blow them away with a drone or something? It just seems too easy. How did we miss, in a city that we know is being contested, how did we miss not dropping a bomb on those guys right there? Help me. I, I wish I could help you. I think the problem is we are too much beholden to a strategy that doesn't take action and sit second fiddle to the Iranians. The Iranians are the best allies that the Baghdad Iraqi government has, and they're calling the shots, not us. Consequently, we don't get to make decisions like that in a timely fashion. We should. Jim, we, we appreciate you joining us and wish we could keep you longer. Thanks so much, though. We'll have you on again. You're welcome. All right, great. So, uh, Mr. Hirschfield, I have a feeling that you could answer my question because, you know, we're transparent on this show. We talked about it before. <laughs> we did indeed. So share our conversation. Well, I think part of the challenge is there are ways to take out those columns, but it's going to kill a lot of innocent people. Now, that may be entirely appropriate. Let's remember, the two most effective air campaigns this country ever had were against Germany and against Japan. Against Germany, 120,000 civilians died I'm not as part of the effort. Not I'm not saying that. you are. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that we as a country better decide what is the nature of the war we're fighting. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be as easy as he suggests. We'll just give some weapons, 
try and split the Sunnis and foment civil war. This is a very ancient struggle in a country that was created artificially because of Sykes-Picot a century ago. If we think a one century creation is going to suddenly fall in the face of a 1500 year religious fight, we are kidding ourselves. This is about realigning our priorities and understanding who we're fighting and what we're trying to achieve. And it's not to create the U.S. East in a new country called Iraq. It's not going to happen. Rare moment coming. You're about to agree with Brad. Well, I do agree with Brad. But more interestingly, not that that's not interesting, <laughs> but more interestingly. And showing increasing wisdom on I your was, part. <laughs> I was agreeing with a lot of what Jim said mm -hmm. until he made the fatal flaw that so many make. And I got to tell you, I hosted a radio show this morning, had an expert on to talk about this. Obviously, we had more time. He did the same thing. He wouldn't give me an answer on what to do about it. Or well, on the Sunnis, he said. For yeah, starters. well, I'm kind of with Brad on that. That's not even close to, to a solution, I'm afraid. It I wish it was. though, didn't it? Playing contrarian. Not, not really. Mm -hmm. and, and I wish it was that simple. But here's what makes me crazy. He, he couldn't help himself but to go to the fact that this is all the fault of taking our soldiers out of Iraq. It may partially be. But you know what? It's also the fault of the fact that we fired the, the Sunni commanders uh, that, yeah. and who went over and became the commanders of ISIS. Right. It may be the, the fault of the Israelis and the Saudis, who General Clark tells us were the people who really funded this to get it started. Who knows? Who There's all these people. But the problem is nobody. And then you get the speaker up there telling us they better get a strategy. Thank you. What do you got, Speaker Boehner? Nobody has a strategy. They just keep complaining about the other side. You politicize the war on terror. That's our biggest problem. Heather, last word. Well, I just think that everybody's afraid to say put boots on the ground, especially because everybody's been asked the question, would you do it again in Iraq? And I think that's a big part and of the you know, problem. It may not, yeah, I happen to agree with you, but it may not be as simple as that. Maybe the first step is you put Saudi group boots on the ground and you make them do it. Yeah. You put our allies over there, and if they don't do it, you yep. make them pay a price. Jordanian boots as well. Plenty yeah. of people that would probably yeah. jump in, no question. Coming up next, the Supreme Court justice officiates a gay wedding. What do you hear about this? Welcome back to the show. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is fueling speculation on how she'll vote on same-sex marriage. First, she presided over a same-sex wedding in Washington this weekend. Second, the New York Times' Maureen Dowd, who attended the wedding, says Ginsburg, with a sly look, emphasized the word constitution when she pronounced the two men married by the powers vested in her by said constitution. That drew thunderous applause. The High Court is expected to announce next month on whether gay marriage should be the law of the land. I know legally Justice Ginsburg is allowed to do this, Brad, but by mentioning the Constitution, is she thumbing her nose at traditional marriage? Probably a little bit, but that's not surprising. She has championed what some people call marriage equality and other people call gay marriage for a long time. So thumbing her nose makes it a little more hostile than I think she deserves, but she is passionately committed to this issue. It seems to me as a matter of law, she's right. I mean, contrast her championing this issue to Jeb Bush describing his opposition based on it being a sacrament. By the way, there is room to be opposed to gay marriage. I get that. But when you invoke purely religious terms, and it's only a sacrament if you're Catholic, even Protestants only think that the Holy Eucharist and, 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 and the church itself are the sacraments. When you say it's a sacrament and therefore it can't exist, you're kind of telling the world, really, we're going to go with canon law, not constitutional law. There are arguments to be made against gay marriage. That ain't one of them. So that's the issue here. I think she's frustrated by the fact that we're not getting legal arguments. We're getting emotional arguments. And as a result, yes, she behaved. She was, all right, you got me. She's th thumbing her nose. I just don't understand why <laughs> yeah. she's thumbing her nose. That's really the truth. She was. It probably was a little beneath her, but I get it. Okay, let I, the lawyers jump in. Heather? I think she's emotional about it too, though. I think that she has she has always been pretty vocal about her, I and mean, she truly thinks, and, and I think that the court will come out to say that this is a equal protection situation, mm -hmm. and that whether you're gay or straight, you're entitled to that. I think that, um, you know, to go to the Jeb Bush issue, I think he was asked a question about what conservative Christians think, so it opens the door for him to answer that way. But I think as far as she's concerned, she shouldn't have tipped her hand, but we all kind of what a have shot. a feeling we know I'm it's I'm stunned to find right? this out. You know, I would have been very upset about this. 
You had she not done it with that sly look on her face, ah, yes, <laughs> that yes. changed Lowering everything. Lowering down, we're just simply quoting the New York nah, Times. Good for her. I That's love all. this little girl. You know, little uh, girl. I do. <laughs> old girl. Did you say R little girl or R old no, girl? Old. Oh my R -B word. RBG is all right with me. I think it was great. <laughs> I I love what she did. You have some fascinating nicknames. You call the Pope Pope Frankie. <laughs> Pope Frankie. You know, Ruth yeah. Gator, Bader Ginsburg. Well, you know, it's because I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very yeah, close yeah. with these people. We go back, you know, two and a half minutes. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bowl with them. Let's face it. Anyway, <laughs> meanwhile, likely 2016 Republican Jeb Bush, Republican candidate, is making it clear he's against a constitutional amendment legalizing gay marriage. Irrespective of the Supreme Court ruling, because they're going to decide whatever they decide, right. and I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, we need to be stalwart supporters of traditional marriage. So. Your thoughts? I honestly couldn't care less what Jeb Bush thinks about it. I honestly really couldn't. Why? Uh, he's, out of, he's completely out of step with, with the public. Mm -hmm. Over 65% have gotten there finally. Uh, I just don't care what he thinks. You know, he's entitled to his point of view. Good for him. Uh, it's not going to make me think more of him or less of him. He just thinks what he thinks and he's wrong. I think mm. he's. I think he's voicing what a lot of people feel about religion, and, yeah. and I do actually think that some of the people who support gay marriage still have some uh, discomfort with the idea of it as a sacrament and in within their religion. But the long and the short of it is, you are correct. No one cares. This is not going to be an issue come the next election because yeah. it's going to be a done deal. Not the next election, but during the primaries, this will be an issue, and maybe he's just trying to only amongst the Republicans. You know, even right, right, right. right. But, but to get the nomination, you don't care. Let's remember, 65 percent of Republicans under the age of 35 support That's gay right. marriage. Right. Yeah. I want to be clear. I think I actually fit into that category. I support traditional marriage. You're 37 You're not under now. 35. No. All right. So you know, bust me about <laughs> that. You're just, still a lot I'm older. Just saying. <laughs> I support traditional marriage. That's a personal choice based on religious conviction. As a matter of law and what all Americans are entitled to, I support access to marriage for any two consulting, consenting adults. It would have been really helpful if he'd made a principled argument why as an individual, as a Catholic, as a man of faith, he really sees marriage as between one man and one woman forever. I get that. And then say, but my religious views are not the same as what the law of the land ought to be. Right. So almost every day in the show, we either have an announcement of who's running for president or who isn't running for president. Like John Bolton is not running for no. president. Yes, he made his announcement. Right, but Lindsey Graham announced that he will be announcing that yes. he'll be running for he president. Announced that he'll be announcing. You know who announced that he isn't running for president today? Oh, who did? In okay, well, I'll, I'll let you work for it a little bit. General. No, 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 no. In relation to this conversation that we're having right now, and why don't you think he's running? He is a governor of a Midwest state. The answer is Mike Pence. Mike Pence. Oh, yes. oh I know why. Well, he's because not of well, happened because in exactly Indiana. what happened in Indiana. Because exactly what happened in Indiana. Shot himself in the foot. Yeah. Well, so well, is that a disqualifier then? If well, you apparently. are, you think? I mean, so? I got to tell you, I I may have said it on the show. He was my dark horse for the Republican nomination really? going way back. I thought he was the one who had the best chance, and then as soon as all that happened, it was over. Yeah, well, go one state over, and you'll find your, your dark horse. <laughs> there you go. One that? state to the <laughs> east <laughs> in Ohio. Give me an O. Got him in. Yes. Got it. John Kasich. Anyway, coming up next, George Stephanopoulos continues to face criticism for his donations. More in a moment. I should have gone the extra mile to avoid even the appearance of a conflict. I apologize to all of you for failing to do that. And welcome back to the show. There are reports this evening that ABC News anchor George Stephanopoulos was more involved in the Clinton Foundation than he's revealed. As you know, he's under fire for not disclosing $75,000 worth of donations to the foundation. And now the Washington Post reporting that Stephanopoulos has served in various volunteer roles for the Clinton Global Initiative for more than a decade. The former top advisor to President Clinton has already apologized for not being more transparent. Really, he did. Anyway, <laughs> Stephanopoulos says he will not participate in any 2016 presidential debates. So far, ABC is sticking by their anchorman, and maybe this is the reason, or a large part of it. That's the front page of the New York Post today. You never guess who makes $105 million. Yes, George Stephanopoulos. Seven-year contract. Not too bad. Sounds like Rick's. Heather, can this storm <laughs> blow over? Or does this have the potential to be a serious 
problem for ABC as we get closer to the election. I think it will blow over. I think most people don't care all that much. Mm. I, I don't think that it necessarily should blow over, but mm. I think it will blow over. I think, you know, there's Kirsten Powers wrote an article today in the uh, op-ed in USA Today mm -hmm. talking about how the fact that four out of five journalists who will admit to being a party say that they're Democrats. So there is a bias in most people and whether and how deep is the bias, whether or not you're over willing to overcome that bias when you're asking questions. I think the fact that we had Stephanopoulos asking questions of the author on the issue where he donated made it all very, very close and very, very unattractive. Mm -hmm. But I think that it will ultimately blow over. So let's say you're running for president and you're from the GOP side of the aisle. Would you ever go on this week, which is the Sunday show that he hosts? I, I would. I would because you'd imagine that if you do well there, then you've done well pretty much anywhere, and mm -hmm. that if you can take him on, and I think, you know, he's a very now smart he's man. Now on defense. Yeah, I, I have a theory, actually, yeah. to, to your point. Yeah. If Hillary Clinton were ever to go on that show, that would she be her to toughest to right. overcompensation. Right. See, right. I am yeah. partial, you're right? You're right. Look, I mean, first of all, I couldn't care less how much money he makes. It's completely irrelevant to this particular issue. I love that he was volunteering for the Clinton Foundation or any other charity. The Nothing, optics don't bother you in any capacity? No, that doesn't. The only thing that, th that hasn't changed and remains at the heart of this is he should mm -hmm. have disclosed it. He made a huge mistake in not disclosing it. Uh, and that's all that this is about. It so really is. And he Wallace should not have done that interview with the author of that right, book. Right. He, he, he should, have, should not have done it, removed or himself, or disclosed. Yes, he should Probably not, not done it right. at all. But do you think the reaction would be the same if Chris Wallace was volunteering for a Bush Foundation kind of initiative? It would be the same for me. I, good for him. I really? Mean, these are I think the reaction things. would be ten times worse. Well, it may be, but certainly not for me. Of course me. it would be worse because, because you know? the culture leans that direction. But the interesting thing here is that even a Corey Rasmussen polling, 30% of Democrats think that Stephanopoulos should recuse himself not only from co debates, but from all presidential coverage. And, and that's, well, they'll have to figure that out. That's where the amount that ABC pays in matters. When you have 105 million invested in someone, you hang with them. I don't begrudge him a dime of what he gets, well, they can but, but they, they have to figure out how not to be invested in him in that way. You, you I, say that the GOP candidates would, would go on there. I say they're, they're not going to go. That costs you ratings, and that's what you're paying him to bring in. Big interviews, and they're not going to go they there. they will go. That's okay. my final one. So what do voters think? Take a look at a new Rasmussen poll. 46% of likely voters say ABC News should ban Stephanopoulos from 2016 coverage. 36% say he should not be banned. So, I mean, well, what can you all, say about that? First of all, that's a poll of a thousand people, so it's not a huge. Number that's what of polls that usually would, sample. But that's Heather. The, thing, but the other thing about that is, if you add the undecided to the nose, you're still talking about something about equal. I think most people don't care. People who watch him on Good Morning America every day do not We're care. We're not talking about that. That's it, it so doesn't matter. If somebody, if they want to see somebody who's on ABC this week. They're going to watch right. it. Right. They're not going to not watch it. Oh, wait a minute. I was going to watch yes, that Yes, they candidate. will. I'm telling you, Rick, uh, no, they, they, no. there will be an inherent bias now. He will be labeled well, we'll as be biased, and people will Let's go to CBS and NBC. Drop. Let's see if the ratings drop. I, I would predict that they will. I, I, wish, I wish you were right. I think different. they're right. I think we have an obligation to point out that it ought to be that way, but it won't. The more aggressively they pull him back, though, it's like the old Tylenol case. When Tylenol pulled all their poison pills, when they weren't even sure what the impact right. was going to be, they brought back the brand. He should step out now, say it's not just no debates I'm going to do. I really am going to step back from covering at least some piece of this election, no matter what. And then he might, he'll save himself. He'll make it even That's if he does That's his entire Sunday and, show, though. He would have right. to remove himself. And they're going to have to figure that one out, maybe for some period of time, something. The problem is they can't because they don't really have a bench. I mean, they could put well, Martha no, Raddatz in there, they I guess. They could. But let Jonathan me Carl, I'd like I to see in that spot, by the way. I do want to say, I do want to say this though, because you brought up, you you compared him with uh, Chris Wallace mm -hmm. as as the supposedly left of center person on the panel. I will tell you that Chris Wallace is the best person on Sunday morning television. He usually is. He's excellent. No, no, no I'm not he's saying superb. Wallace because of Wallace. I'm saying Wallace because he's connected to Fox. Right. Right. So right. Right. people automatically he, uh, say he's they conservative, would. but he's as good, maybe best, not as good, I but almost as good an uh, interviewer as his father was. Yeah. Right, and uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, he absolutely does a, a great That's job. Right. And Marco Rubio found that out last week. Right, right? he's going to get a free Tortured ride. Tortured him. Day. Anyway, this somehow came a segment about Chris Wallace. Go for it. <laughs> anyway, coming up next, it's potluck time. That's where we share our favorite stories of the day. We go around the table. Mine is one of them. This will be tremendous. You must stick around. This is the Daily Wrap, <laughs> only on Newsmax.
wrap. Time for potluck. And Mr. Hirschfield, what are you serving up tonight? I'm serving up Google, Apple, and 140 other technology companies at a discount. that have turned. Not well. We can look at the stock market. No <laughs> discount here. This is them turning to the Obama administration and asking that they not side with their own security and and, and military organization, not the FBI, not the NSA, and not have better encryption on our phones. Now that's a very weird thing. They actually write, strong encryption is the cornerstone of the modern information economy's security. That's 140 companies, prominent technologists, and civil society groups. Now here's the problem with that. This device is one of the single most important tools in terrorism in the 21st century. And the idea that we think that doesn't need to be watched carefully is a very serious challenge. I get it. The privacy debate is an important one, and personal privacy is sacred in this country, if anything is. But here's the thing. When they go on to say that privacy is a cornerstone to the information economy, this is Apple and Google. Let's be clear. Privacy is a cornerstone to the economy economy. <laughs> they have billions of dollars at stake here. And at the very least, they should dial back these sacred claims of privacy and admit their real concern with encryption being weakened is that people will do less business online. There is something fundamentally wrong with these companies, given the billions they have at stake, entering into a fray which has real safety and security implications against terrorism, about kidnapping, about child molesting, and say we're perfectly good with having devices that cannot be cracked even when a court gives a warrant to the FBI or the NSA to do that. At some point, they have lost the thread here. Privacy is sacred. When you have billions at stake economically, less so. I'm going to go back to that same quote. Yes, encryption is critical to the information economy. But if you're Google and Apple, it's critical to the economy economy. And we should be clear about that. It's about the economy economy, mm -hmm. stupid. That Something like your, that. Your, your bumper sticker. I was at a party uh, last week, and somebody who really doesn't follow politics all that much, somehow ISIS came up. And she said, I never even heard of this ISIS, like even like a year ago. And why are they suddenly this huge terror group? Did they really recruit that fast? Like, should I be scared? That sort of thing. Like, legitimate question for somebody who just like does her job every day and takes care of her kids and doesn't right. live in a little bubble a like real we person. Do. Right, exactly. And I said, you know what? The, the reason why they grew so quickly was primarily because of social media, their ability to recruit, but more importantly, their ability to communicate <laughs> terror. 90,000 right? tweets a day. If you have one of these in the world today, you can communicate better than most countries could 50 years ago. If you have one of these in your hand today, you have more information than the finest we're, library We're missing in the an world. important element that I got to raise here. There is a solution to this if we believed that the government would use it honestly. You said the critical thing. If you get a warrant to do right. that, you should be able to do it. How do you do that if there is a key? that the government can have that once they've gotten that warrant, they can encrypt and get into your phone. The problem is, is that nobody trusts that the government will only do that with a warrant. If we did, easy solution. No, but Apple and Google problem. says flat out, they're opposed to that That's even if you have the warrant. Because they say if somebody can get through, anybody can get through. They That's don't want argument. it done. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've got to move on to something else, something else that people don't want done, is Congress. This is my turn getting a raise. Now, House Minority Whip Steny uh, Hoyer uh, wants a raise, and, and many other members of Congress do as well. They mostly earn $174,000 a year, but they haven't gotten a bump in pay in seven years. Now, before you answer whether they deserve a raise, factor in this. Americans work roughly 240 days a year. Members of Congress, 135 to 155 days per year. So. Does, uh, this is almost like a yay or nay, but does Congress deserve a raise given their approval ratings are so low, their job performance therefore is deemed as so low, but yet it's still, it's seven years and there is a cost of living thing that goes on and they might have to maintain two houses. Right, so that's the key. Deserve a raise? Absolutely not. 
recognize that most of them do maintain two households, and that 50-year-olds, however poorly they're doing it, serving their nation, shouldn't be sleeping on sofa beds mm -hmm. with someone else in the next room. So let's do it that way. Let's build in a housing allowance on a need basis so that people can live with dignity and comfort while they're serving the country, even if they do it badly. But merit-based pay for Congress? <laughs> that, <laughs> That's no, Rick, that Rick. is the definition of an oxymoron. Rick, you said before that actually some members of Congress uh, you know actually live in their offices. Yeah, they yeah. do. That's they do. That's amazing. I, I don't think you pay people because they need it. I think you pay people because they earn it. And yeah. if they're not earning it, then they can go somewhere else where they can make more money or not need two households. How, I about, don't think how about an alternate system of paying Congress? Let each district be responsible to pay their own congressmen. They're the ones who send these bums to <laughs> office. <laughs> they all get together. Nobody likes them. The only people who like these congressmen are the people who send them there. Let them decide if they want to okay. give them a raise out of their money because I don't want my <laughs> money to okay. stay. Here, here's my solution. It's very simple. Do the thing that we did in college. You get a roommate. That cuts down the rent, right? So, but your roommate has to be a member of the other party. Oh, so okay. imagine Paul idea. Ryan, the Alan Grayson, show. they got to get real long. Other. The reality show and the advertising It'll pays pay for, for the rent. Exactly. <laughs> Yay or nay is next. Stick right there. And it's happy time, people. Therefore, it's time for yay or nay. It's the little game where everybody wins. Anyway, in New York City, NYPD Commissioner Bill Bratton is considering granting amnesty to 1.2 million low-level criminal offenders. Mr. Bratton wants those with outstanding warrants from small crimes like disorderly conduct, drinking in public, and others to be dismissed. Critics say that it opens the door for lawbreakers. Yay or nay, Rick, should the city grant amnesty? It's a little more subtle than that. Uh, I think what he's got in mind is the, the, the instance of somebody who let their dog off the leash for a few seconds to clean up the, the, the you know. Which the, I do every day. Right, and, and end up getting a ticket and they don't show up in court. It's, it, there's a subtlety to it. It is a tricky one. We have to wait and see how this fleshes out. Heather. I'm a, I'm a qualified yay. I, I agree with Rick, but I do think that it is the wave of the future. You know, we're talking about trying to re reform our criminal justice system. And this is a, a way, and I'm a big fan of Commissioner Bratton, so I will go yay. Interesting. That's a very heavy backup. Yeah, right. I'm a yay as well on this, as long as the, here the devil is in the details, yeah. because fair beating is not, that's theft. There should be no amnesty. Mm -hmm. Let dog off the leash to clean up the poop grow up. It's not a big deal. Yeah. So I think here it's really going to be who's on the list, what offenses are on the list. Generally, good idea. I would have been arrested at least 17 times for not... We could arrange we'll it. We'll visit you we in jail. We arrange it, really. Yeah, we can make that happen. <laughs> okay, sometimes you just don't have those bags on you. Anyway, enjoy your dinner. <laughs> How would you like this job added to your LinkedIn page? The Saudi government has a wonderful job opportunity if you're a complete sadist. The country now looking for eight capital punishment executioners. <laughs> Details of the gig include, must be prepared to implement the rule of murder by Islamic law after the issuance of the Islamic ruling. So if you're ready to dish out the usual beheadings and stonings and other medieval forms of torture and death in the name of Islamic rule, there's a job waiting for you. Will Saudi Arabia have a problem filling these positions, Ricky? How are the dental benefits? Outstanding, I would think. Well, in that case, two of us couldn't have the job anyhow. <laughs> so that's a may. You two can consider it. Thank you. I think Heather. Brad and I are out on this one. I, you know what? I just think it's crazy that they're one of our biggest allies, and yet they're advertising for this type of job. I think that they, and then they'll probably find plenty of people to fill it. Yeah, I actually looked on LinkedIn today, executioner, and only stuff Can't for wrestling it. came yeah. up. Yeah, <laughs> right anyway, Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC. I've never eaten there has done the impossible. They raised their iconic spokesperson, Colonel Sanders, from the dead. Howdy folks, this is me, Colonel Sanders, and this is my mandolin band. Is mandolin music still America's favorite kind of music? That's a trick question. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> I'm back, America. <laughs> Interesting. It's like Bill Clinton with a goatee. <laughs> yeah, that's a good commercial. Right? Fascinating. Yeah. So do you like the new Daryl Hammond-led uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken? Because you're warm with the Bill Clinton parts, the guy who plays Clinton yeah. on Saturday Night Live. Unqualified yay. Agreed. I'm nostalgic. I'm a yay. Yeah, you? no, not so much. And I don't think most people are going to know. <laughs> I'm a not so much. Mm -hmm. I don't think most people are going to know what exactly that is. I mean, you got to remember, this is generational. 
It's true, Brad. Totally yay. <laughs> Much better to have the Colonel than KFC. Yeah. Personalize it. I like it, yeah. and I grew up with him, so he's back. It's true. I really never have had Kentucky Fried Chicken. Neither have I. It just but I can still love yeah, the Colonel. No. Oh, I've had tons <laughs> of it. <laughs> I still love the, the Colonel. Oh, I, I don't eat it anymore. Anyway, we got to go, got to go, got to go. Rugby is a sport loved by the world over, and some rugby players are now taking cues from showboating American sports legends like Terrell Owens, Deion Sanders, Allen Iverson for acting out during games. Check out Collins and Jira this guy, scores Collins his 200th Kenya, try for example. Kenya, Caused a little stir after he scored during a recent match. Okay, everything's going normal. Takes the Sharpie out, just like Terrell Owens did against Seattle back in, what was that, 2003? But then he decides, I'm going to sign the camera as well, which is also done by American sports people. Here is the only problem. Come back on me, ladies and gentlemen. See my phone here? It's got a little protective shield, okay, to make sure that, you know, my fingerprints don't get on it and all that fun stuff. And most cameras in America do. The problem is this one did not. And it cost that camera, then therefore, at least whoever owned it, $100,000 because you'd never be able to get those markers Was off Was it again. insured? Wasn't insured. Well, that's the question. Should he have to pay for it? Yay, nay, nay? Yay. Pay for it. Yes. Yay, if it wasn't insured. All right. That'll do it for today. Stay tuned for Newsmax Prime with J.D. Hayworth, special guest, Governor Pataki. He talks about his presidential aspirations. Good night.